For much of the human history, there was no need to worry about career change or lifelong learning. Most people were living off agriculture and cattle breeding. They would acquire all the skills required for their bare survival early in their lives. From one generation to the next, their lives seemed quite similar. The major uncertainties were associated with what was popularly known as the four riders of the apocalypse, the plague, the war, famine and the death. Those were their four greatest fears. Which of the four should we still fear today? Death was always an inevitable ultimate outcome and it remains so to this day. We are doing our best to delay it, but we still found no way of cheating it, although some are trying very hard. War is still very much with us, and it may be an even greater threat than ever before given the advanced technology of modern weapons. Famine is not worrying us nearly as much as it used to, although there are still parts of the world in which hardly anything changed over the past few centuries, and which remain very much affected. There are perhaps some new riders of the apocalypse in our days, such as road traffic accidents, terrorism, and climate change. But if we were to pick one that we should all fear more than all of the other riders combined, it should probably be the first one, the plague. Clearly, we don't mean it literally, as the bubonic plague, which is a specific infectious disease that was historically caused by Yersinia pestis and was transmitted by rats in unsanitary medieval cities. What we mean by plague today is an unanticipated, dramatic, rapid outbreak of an entirely unknown infectious disease where a new microbial pathogen finds its way to mutate and gain the ability to infect our species while we had no previous exposure to it and have no lines of defense. Such development could still result in a massive, sudden, dramatic mortality, rapid spread throughout the human population, accompanied by global panic and mass devastation. There were many episodes in our history when our ancestors experienced such scares and were left decimated. One of the earliest records was left by ancient Greeks. In the 5th century BC, the plague of Athens, thought to be a form of typhus, claimed some hundred thousand lives. But this was merely a warning of much worse times that were looming. In the 2nd and the 3rd century, plagues of Antonin and Cyprian, likely caused by smallpox, killed millions of people in the Roman Empire. And it was going to get worse. In the 6th century, plague of Justinian, thought to be the first bubonic plague, may have claimed up to 30 million souls, killing one in three people living in Europe and the Mediterranean basin. But even that wasn't the worst that our ancestors had to endure. In the middle of the 14th century, bubonic plague hit again, now remembered as the notorious Black Death and killing more than 70 million people worldwide and more than one in three people living in Europe at the time. The plague continued to linger in Europe through smaller outbreaks, accompanied by a scary chronic infection called leprosy. In the 17th century, bubonic plague was causing panic yet again. It hit several cities in Italy before it struck London and Vienna and reaching Eastern Europe and Russia in the 18th century. Those later outbreaks claimed hundreds of thousands of lives, but fell short of causing devastation at the scale that was seen in the times of Black Death. But something even worse than Black Death was happening to people who were not living in the known world at the time. Global explorations carried out by the strongest European nations and their navies did not only discover new continents, but also introduced deadly infectious diseases to many indigenous populations. By that time, Europeans were genetically highly selected to resist epidemics of deadly infections. But indigenous peoples of the Americas and Australia were never exposed 
to smallpox, measles, influenza or typhus. Their contacts with the explorers from Europe caused massive mortality and the complete disappearance of some of those peoples. In the 16th century in today's Mexico, an epidemic of an unknown disease, likely a viral hemorrhagic fever, smallpox or both, killed 80% of the native population, ruining the civilization of Aztecs. American Indians, Incas and Mayas fared no better in the following centuries, and many now believe that the death of more than 90% of the native populations of the New World was caused by Old World diseases, above all smallpox, measles and flu. Smallpox also led to catastrophic mortality among the native populations of Australia, killing between 30 and 50% of Aboriginal Australians, New Zealand Maori, Hawaiians and the native population of Easter Islands. But some new diseases were brought from Americas back to Europe too. Syphilis was introduced to Europe after Columbus's voyages and it was more frequently fatal than it is today, becoming a major killer in Europe during the Renaissance period. Increased migrations in the 19th century through trade and travel brought about a new scare, cholera. Between 1816 and 1899, the world has seen six consecutive pandemics of cholera, which killed tens of millions of people from India to China, Russia, Europe and both coasts of North America. Unexpectedly, an old, fearsome enemy also made its return. The third pandemic of plague started in China in 1855, almost exactly 500 years after the Black Death. It spread to India, where 10 million people died, and then throughout the rest of the world, reaching even as far as San Francisco. Masked by those six waves of cholera and an unexpected return of bubonic plague, another pandemic struck the world at the end of the 19th century. It was a well-known one, influenza. The Greek physician Hippocrates, the father of medicine, first described it in the 5th century BC. This time it started in Uzbekistan, became known as the Russian flu, spread literally everywhere and killed one million people. But in the world that was buzzing with industrial development, building of large cities, travel and trade, it was hardly noticed as anything more than a really bad episode of a flu. No one could predict at the time that this was an almost gentle announcement of what was to come, a period that may well be remembered as the worst seven years in the history of modern humans was just ahead. In 1914, the World War I broke out. Speaking of the four riders of the apocalypse, this was a rider of the war as no other. It claimed 17 million lives, left further 20 million people wounded and caused massive devastation. But it got a lot worse. It created perfect conditions for influenza to strike again. This time, a Spanish flu ripped through an exhausted, undernourished, misplaced and depressed human population as the war ended, killing 75 million people. This was likely the worst case of double blow that we've experienced as a species, and it happened only 100 years ago. Flu pandemics keeps coming back every 10 to 30 years, as the virus keeps mutating in wild aquatic birds and then finds a way to jump to humans. Asian flu pandemics in 1957 killed 2 million people, and the Hong Kong flu pandemics in 1968 left another 1 million people dead. Besides the bubonic plague, cholera, leprosy and flu, it is clear that the epidemic diseases that historically inflicted massive burden of mortality on our ancestors were also smallpox, measles and typhus. Smallpox has surely killed well over 1 billion people throughout the known history. It was a highly contagious disease 
caused by the variola virus, and also the first one that we managed to completely eradicate from the planet through vaccination. Measles contribute to destruction of civilizations of Central and South America and caused hundreds of millions of deaths throughout human history. Typhus is sometimes called a camp fever because it typically flares up during armed conflicts. It was first described during the Crusades and it remained a prominent cause of death in many other subsequent wars. Between the 16th and the 20th century, it is thought that more military personnel were killed by typhus than from military action, both while in combat and while imprisoned in detention camps. In the 21st century, we are beginning to forget about the catastrophic collective past and the unimaginable death toll that infectious diseases imposed on our ancestors. We are the first generations of humans who no longer fear infectious diseases. Thanks to antibiotics and vaccines which keep us safe, the human population increased from about 1.5 billion at the beginning of the 20th century to 7.5 billion at the beginning of the 21st century. That is five times more humans on the face of the planet and mainly because we learn how to prevent and treat the most dangerous infections. But how safe are we really? Microbes are incredibly abundant in nature and they have very short lifespans. They can adjust to threats such as antibiotics very quickly through mutations. Massive overuse of antibiotics, not only to protect humans but also farmed animals, is putting us all in danger. It allows microbes to adjust to antibiotics and develop so-called antibiotic resistance leading to new future epidemics with untreatable new strains of bacteria. In addition to antibiotic resistance, it almost defies belief that there are people who are beginning to question the value and safety of vaccines, leading to reduced completion of population vaccination and loss of our so-called herd immunity. There is also a theoretical concern over a phenomenon called serotype replacement. This takes into account that various strains of bacteria, also known as serotypes, compete against each other in nature. If we use a vaccine to prevent infections with the most prevalent strains, then those strains will struggle to survive and may soon be replaced by some other strains. Those new strains are presently not included in the life-saving vaccines and we are not adapted to them, so they may be even more dangerous for us. Clearly, our apparent safety from infections is heavily dependent on antibiotics and vaccines, and we should continue to invest heavily in improving the existing ones and adding the new ones. Another growing concern is our recently acquired ability to manipulate genetic code of bacteria and viruses. Understanding of what makes them contagious and lethal could theoretically lead to the development of genetically engineered strains that could wipe out our entire species. Historically, there were examples of the use of anthrax, smallpox, plague and cholera as weapons in a biological warfare. We can only hope that no such idea would be considered in modern times our current level of technology could already lead to artificially designed and genetically manipulated strains that could eventually cause far more deaths than any weapons. Whenever a new epidemic strikes, this is an opportunity to use the public attention to improve health information systems and build infrastructure in those fragile health systems that could prevent further outbreaks, or at least help to deal with them much better while guaranteeing the safety of health workers. But health information systems are weak in most of poor countries where these threats are looming large. The communication between the scientists and the doctors in the field and the, those who have the mandate to process their messages and present them to the media and the public has typically been suboptimal. There were examples where too much hype was raised over the issues that weren't nearly as dramatic, while in others not enough concern was raised 
when it really needed to be. Even though we may be feeling safer from infections in the 21st century, we've already witnessed quite a few scares in the first 15 years of this century alone. Firstly, in 2002, more than 750 deaths resulted from SARS, severe acute respiratory syndrome, a new atypical pneumonia caused by coronavirus. Rapid response from health authorities helped to stop the transmission, but the disease has not been eradicated and it could re-emerge and become a pandemic. Then, in 2009, flu pandemic broke out. It caused a major scare because its antigenic signature, H1N1, was the same as that of the Spanish flu pandemic in 1918. Luckily, this new strain of H1N1 resulted from reassortments of bird, swine and human flu viruses, which led to a common popular term for this pandemic, swine flu. It caused about 15,000 deaths in the world. In 2012, outbreaks of MERS, Middle East Respiratory Syndrome, were reported in more than 20 countries and they were again caused by a newly emerged variant of coronavirus. MERS caused more than 400 deaths in those countries and it remains a threat. A year later, in 2013, we were reminded of the dangers posed to us all by viral hemorrhagic fevers, all of which are highly contagious and deadly, with the theoretical potential to become pandemics. In this case, Ebola virus epidemic devastated the already very poor countries of Guinea, Liberia and Sierra Leone in Western Africa. About half of affected cases died and more than 10,000 deaths were confirmed. The World Health Organization was heavily criticized for a slow and disorganized response to this epidemic in a number of subsequent reports and analysis, while non-governmental agencies such as Doctors Without Borders were praised for their role and help. Finally, the most recent alarm in this century was raised in 2015 when an outbreak of Zika virus affected more than 10 countries in the Americas. The virus, spread by mosquitoes, causes Zika fever, a minor illness that causes fever and a rash. But early in 2016, World Health Organization raised particular concerns because evidence grew that Zika infections of pregnant women could cause birth defects and microcephaly in particular. With all the investments today that go into weapons production, cosmetics industry, entertainment, sports, infrastructure projects, the world should really find resources to also build a reliable and functioning health information systems and a following infrastructure in terms of laboratory capacity to be able to raise the alarm and collect reliable information quickly and then spread this information in a collaborative way to scientific community and communicate it responsibly to the public. It is remarkable how much effort is being invested in building other resources for humanity and how underprepared we all are for something that could make all those efforts entirely irrelevant. We were simply running our luck for a very long time, but now we have an opportunity to become the masters of our own fate, at least when it comes to the threat from new epidemics. It's really one of the most obvious choices for us all. We should really seize this opportunity before we live to regret that we didn't.